This episode is supported by Prudential. So what are we doing? I'm here with Mike Rognetta from Idea Channel, Diana from Physics Girl, and Joe from It's Okay to Be Smart. Hi, Vanessa. Hello. So first question for you, Diana. How would you use these objects to mount a candle to the wall to illuminate the room? <sighs> so you have a box of tacks. Okay. It was meant to be a box, but it's actually it's the not bottom of a square. <laughs> it's the bottom of a coffee cup that I cut out with scissors. You can call you it a box. Have, if thank you. Want. You have uh, a candle and you have some matches. Okay. Ooh. Can I use them in any way? In any way you like. Without setting the room on fire. Without setting the room on fire. Imagine it's this room. Imagine there are no okay. lights in this room, and you need okay. to somehow uh, solve this little puzzle to make the room bright and happy. The, these are obviously going to light the candle. Um, okay. Okay, I think I would have to. I would make some sort of a platform and pin the the, the and kind of kind of secure the candle, thusly to the wall. To the wall. Okay. This way. One of the how, bottom two. How's the platform going to come into existence? I'm going to push the pins into the wall. I'm going to rest the candle on top of two of them. I'm going to put one pin on either side to hold it in place. Oh, okay. So you're going to make a pin platform. So pins mm -hmm. down the bottom and everything. That's what I'm going to do. Because I would sandwich the candle this way. Okay. And I would take one of these. Okay. And then I would put, kind of, should I do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is your set. We're actually on the Idea Channel set today. So if you want to put a hole in the wall of your set, I don't you know can if do I it. Uh, Morgan, holes in, <laughs> holes in the wall. Do you think the candle wick will be too close to the wall? There's only one way to find out. Oh, Morgan's upset. No. I'm thinking maybe like, mm -hmm. like melting a little of the wax mm -hmm. and sticking it to a tack. And then just sticking that into the wall. Oh, interesting. I'm thinking maybe I would. So it's a it's a horizontal candle lamp. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Or I'm thinking maybe I would just melt the wax a little bit and uh -huh. then stick that to the wall with just the wax and not even use the tacks. I mean, the set's new. I don't know. Yeah. I don't really yeah. Burn How about you pretend that my arm is the wall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems much more safe. I would maybe. Uh, Tack the box to the wall. I don't know how. How would you melt the wax onto the wall? Like, like. Uh, how does gravity work in this situation? <laughs> well, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'm asking you. <laughs> the force countering the force of gravity would be the friction between the wax and the wall. Once but how is it going to drip onto the wall? You just want to melt it. You're going to oh, use yeah, the match yeah, yeah. to melt use a the little match bit. To melt okay. Back, okay. And okay. then and then stick that to, to okay. the wall. It would be. Yeah. I thought you were talking about dripping wax, and I'm like, mm -mm. no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Just no, heat that this can't, up. That can't drip onto a wall. Just, no, yeah. no, no, no. No. Good question. <laughs> this test is called the candle problem. And it was first used by a psychologist called Carl Duncker in 1945. What is suggested when yeah. this test was first done is that you would tack the box to the wall. Sure. And then you would put the drip some wax into here and put the candle in, in the box. Duncker coined this term called functional fixedness. Which is, <laughs> I like that term. Yeah, which is a, a mental block that people have when they cannot use objects in different ways outside of their proposed function. So basically, if you put it in a simpler English, it's just that you imagine that things have a fixed function and it's hard to think around that. So wait, this object is part of the available... Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and what is really interesting is when they had small linguistic differences when they were doing the test, when they said box of tax instead mm -hmm. of box and tax. Mm -hmm. People don't think to use the box as often. Right. Yeah. Which one did you say to me? I said box of tax. People would identify people these would as more, two separate people things. People would more often use the box. Yeah. Didn't even occur yeah. to me. That, uh, now that, that's very obvious now that you say it. And what people have found when they've done the test is that children, younger children, like younger than five, actually perform better at using things in different ways. No preconceived I guess, notion of what it's of, for. Of what, yeah, yeah, what you should use things for. Well, I think I did great. Your solution to the problem was very similar to the one that suggested. Yeah, you had the same kind of logic to get there. I feel like 60% smart. <laughs> It's okay to be 60% smart. <laughs> okay. Second question for you. Mary's mother has four children. Okay. April, May, June, and what's the name of the fourth child? I mean, the, so my gut answer is to say July? Mary. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mary. Yes. 
Mary is the fourth child. Yeah. A lot of people like to say July, <laughs> as you probably would have guessed. Wait, so I asked the question again? Mary's mother. <laughs> oh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's your brain that loves pattern recognition, and essentially we're... I would say kind of lazy, but to put it in a nicer way, we'd like to operate as efficiently as possible and find the quickest way to make a decision and to mm -hmm. think around a problem. So you said Mary Smither has four children, and so I was picturing, like, yeah. I have to picture yeah. things in my head. So and were I you like, picturing Mary first, and then you were adding the yeah. other three? Luckily, I, I don't trust you. I really like that one. You do? Yeah, that's yeah. really, because because you, right, it, it abandons the premise so quickly and gets mm -hmm. you so focused mm -hmm. on pattern recognition yeah. that you don't realize you are already in possession of the answer. You know, uh, people with accents that are different to those of the people consuming the media and such mm. that they watch uh, dis distrust people with accents more. So there was a cognitive psychologist called Herbert A. Simon. He looked at psychology through a mathematical lens and he used the term heuristics quite a lot. You have an accent? A heuristic is a practical shortcut the brain uses to get to an answer, but it's not necessarily the right answer. Third question for you, Diana. Oh, yes. Yes. I feel like I want to call you physics girl because everyone, <laughs> nobody, nobody knows your actual name. <laughs> well, you're teaching it to them. Yeah, yeah, this is educational. Well, I have a list of words here that I would like you to read out from the word red as fast as you can from the word red as fast as, as i can fast as you okay can. red yellow green blue red blue yellow green blue red red yellow green blue red blue yellow green blue red uh red yellow green blue red blue yellow green blue red excellent thank okay. you and now i would like you to read this list of words uh starting from red as fast as you can as again. fast oh man yeah. i feel yeah. like this one's gonna be harder okay well like, who knows okay yeah well, red yellow green blue red blue yellow green blue red Red, yellow, green, blue, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, red. Red, yellow, green, blue, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, red. Great. Well done. That was actually really quick. Have you seen this test before? No. Really? No. Have you done this test before? I have done a test like this before. Okay. It's, it's called the Stroop Color Test, as you may know. And what it measures is the Stroop effect. I feel like we did this in, in like, like middle school or something as yeah, like possibly. a challenge. And yeah, and they show you that it's harder when you're, you've got two things you're processing at the same time. Definitely. Now, the Stroop effect is the difference in time that it takes from you reading the first list where the colors were the same as the words to the second list where the colors and the words are different. When you read this one, your time is meant to be much slower. Yeah, it really messes with your, like, you have these natural categories in your head mm -hmm. that you just unconsciously a little biased towards this and that and it really kind of gives you a brain cramp. Mm -hmm. I felt like I slowed down at blue next to yellow, okay. where blue is yellow and yellow is blue. Right. And yeah. that was one where I was like, I could feel my brain sort of skipping a beat. And it was first done by a man called John Ridley Stroop in 1935. I think he has the best name. Stroop. Stroop, John Ridley Stroop. <laughs> Isn't that great? I think that's really great. I wish that were my grandpa. Your brain is kind of working overtime when you do this and you are both processing language and color information at the same time. So the, the idea is that reading doesn't require your controlled attention. Mm. But the act of you reading uses enough attentional resources to take that away from your color processing ability. Reading is almost automatic to us, but not so much because it still uses a little bit of, yeah. of uh, information processing. And when you add color information processing into that, it becomes hard to balance between two mm -hmm. areas of your brain. It's Yeah, it's like, you know when you find yourself driving sometimes and mm -hmm. you realize you've been on autopilot? Yeah, like yeah. You, you realize you read like that, and then I felt yeah. myself on the other one, you're like, yeah. oh, I gotta break out of my usual little pattern, and it's just Yeah, like, when they do this study with bilingual people, and bilingual people actually um, have this uh, kind of weird processing thing. It's like a processing superpower, I would say, for people huh. who speak two languages, but they can do this more quickly than people who are monolingual. So the Stroop effect is less. Bilingual people had a better capacity to regulate their attention responses. Sure. No, I mean, the thing with psychology tests is that quite often it's hard to say why you do a test better. It could be a practice effect. It could be because you are bilingual. It could be because you're more intelligent. Red and yellow, it's actually blue, used red, a blue, lot yellow, in those green, brain blue. training apps that are questionable, except <laughs> right. except they, they have a lot of practice effects. So you get better at a lot of those tasks over time. And this is one of them. Hmm. Woo! Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much, Vanessa.
for tricking me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was super fun. Great. And I'm a lot less stressed out than I thought I would be. <laughs> yeah, I didn't trick you that much. You did really well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Prudential for sponsoring this episode. It's human nature to prioritize present needs and what matters most to us today. But when planning for your retirement, it's better to prioritize tomorrow. According to a Prudential study, one in three Americans is not saving enough for retirement. And over 52% are not on track to be able to maintain their current standard of living. Go to prudential.com slash save more and see if you start saving more today, you can continue to enjoy the things you love tomorrow.